Looking back at friends once more. Praise the Lord, I have a better place to go. In a while, I'll meet the reaper who has called so many home. Jesus' home must be like. 
What do you all think heaven might look like? Castles, that's right. In, um, in the book of John, they talk about, uh, Jesus talks about how his fathers built many mansions and castles in heaven, which means there's a room for everyone as long as you believe in Jesus. The Bible tells us some things about heaven, like what a place of joy it will be. We will be able to walk with God and will be reunited with loved ones. There will be no more sadness, pain, or fear, only love. Heaven is a beautiful, exciting promise, and there's a place just for you. And I printed out this maze. And you know, when you start at the beginning, you get to going through it and you hit all these little dead ends, don't you? You know. Well, sometimes, you know, in life it's hard and we hit these little dead ends. But the only thing that we need to remember is when we get to the end, that as long as we, our whole path through life, that we believe in Jesus, that we're going to be in heaven with him <coughs> So, let's pray. Our prayer is, Dear God, thank you for preparing a wonderful place for me in heaven. Amen. And it is the God of grace and God of glory who is going to take us to heaven. Number 577 is our name. Let's stand together as we sing.
are so thankful for your life, for your creation. We're thankful, Lord, that you have given us this day, another day, to breathe and to know others, to be able to move. Lord, each one of us came here today, and, and there's strength in that, and all strength comes from you. You have called us to have being and have our being in you, to love in you and to be loved by you, to express your love to our community. So Father, with all these gifts that you've given to us and the wonderful creation in which you placed us, we give thanks this morning. Father, we, we come with heavy hearts in some cases. We come with joyful hearts in other cases because of what you have done and uh, certain circumstances. We're thankful, Lord, for Kenneth's uh, good report. We're thankful for answered prayer. We're thankful, Lord, for um, a brighter light in your house this morning. And so, Lord, we're thankful about these things. We're also bringing our friends to you this morning and our loved ones, our families. And Father, as we call their names here in this worship service, we know that they're already known about in heaven. And you're glad to hear our prayers. And you're glad to answer our prayers. And so, Father, we pray in faith this morning for these, our loved ones. We pray for Mrs. Harris. We pray for Winford Dixon. We pray for Carolyn Ingalls. We pray for Billy Whitten. Father, we pray for Corey Whitten. Corey. And Ted Bean. Ted. Bo Frazier. Oh. We pray for Kim Lair. Yeah. And Danny Frazier. Yeah. We pray for Linda Sorrell and Cleo Brown. Yeah. We pray for Robert and Betty Kibben. Oh. We pray for Kathleen Brown. Yeah. And Charles Gatman. Charles. We pray for Linda Brown. Linda. Margaret Brown. Margaret. Larry Davis. Larry. Betty T. Father, for those far away from us right now, we ask your care on them. We pray for Samantha Clint. Amen. We pray for Amy Brewer. Amen. We pray for our military, Zachary Miller. Amen. Peter Wilkin. Amen. Chris Clint. Chris. Father, there are a whole host of unspoken requests here in this building this morning. People on our hearts, circumstances that we care about, needs that we see, and even the unspoken, the unimagined conditions of life where we sense something might be wrong in somebody's life, but we can't put a finger on it. We don't know. We simply pray for that person. Lord, there always are times when we wonder about what's going on in someone's life, someone we haven't heard about or heard from, talked with in a, in a good while. And so, Father, as we come before you this morning and laying out our hearts, laying out the names of our loved ones, laying out uh, express needs that we have lifted up to you, and laying out our joys and the thanksgiving for your answers to prayer and for the way that you have cared for us. Father, we come humbly, bowing before your throne. We come in faith, uh, come to the throne room of God because of the blood of Jesus Christ. So Lord, we're thankful that you've given us breath and life to come before you. We're thankful that you've given us time and our loved ones time to respond to your great gospel and your great gift, the cross of Jesus Christ. And then the season of Lent to uh, look toward the reality of denying self and picking up the cross and following you. Lord, we're thankful for all of it. And now, Father, as we lay our prayers before you, we express our faith that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins when we confess, that you are faithful to answer and to provide for your loved ones. Lord, most of all, we thank you that there is room for everyone in heaven that you've built many mansions, many rooms, and you've provided for us, both here and for eternity. Lord, you are so good to us. We pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.
a reading from the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 2, 15 through 17, <coughs> chapter 3, 1 through 7. The Lord God placed the man in the Garden of Eden to tend and care for it. But the Lord God gave him this warning. You may freely eat any fruit in the garden except fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. If you eat this fruit, you will surely die. Now the serpent was shrewdest of all the creatures the Lord God had made. Really, he asked the woman, did God really say you must not eat any of the fruit in the garden? Of course you may eat it, the woman told him. It's only the fruit from the tree at the center of the garden we are not allowed to eat. God says we must not eat it or even touch it or we will die. Don't <coughs> die, the serpent hissed. God knows that your way will be open when you eat it. You will become just like God, knowing everything both good and evil. The woman was convinced. The fruit looked so fresh and delicious, and it would make her so wise, so she ate some of the fruit. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her. And he ate it too. At that moment, their eyes were opened, and they suddenly felt ashamed of their nakedness. So they strung fig leaves together around their hips to cover themselves.
And by the way, just in case you're wondering, the pastor is not the CEO of the church. Jesus is the CEO of the church. And so what Jesus has said, we want to do, and that's what a mission statement is. It's a concise sentence or two that says, this is what we're all about. This is the way we minister. This is the way we uh, go to work in our community. So if you will, take a hard look at that this week. Uh, we've only got two weeks left before we're going to vote on it. So. Uh, we'd love to have your feedback. We'd love to know what you like about it. We'd love to know what you don't like about it. We'd also like to know if you have ideas about how to make it a better statement to fit this church, fit the ministry that needs to be done in this community. One other thing about bulletins is, uh, like I said, Elizabeth puts in the bulletin what I tell her, particularly when I give her a sermon title. And um, have you ever seen one of those gaffes in a bulletin where, you know, it's a... Uh, it, it just, it hardly seems to work. It's a, it's, it was intended to be said one way, but it turns out to a completely different uh, uh, saying. And it's that way in our bulletin this morning. I didn't realize it when I constructed the sermon title and where it would go and what it would look like. But if you look in that, in the bulletin, it says, Pastor's Sermon, who really knows how bad it is? <laughs> Think about it. I mean, that's pretty funny. I'm, I'm going to give Elizabeth a new title and a new job. Check the sermon title. Make sure it doesn't look that bad. That really is the title of the sermon. Who really knows how bad it is? Not the sermon. But this is all about, and we have been looking at some of the Bible's more familiar texts, the one that, that we know so well. This one is in Jeremiah chapter 17 and it's verse 9 where it says, Who can know the heart? It's desperately wicked. So the question is normal. Who really knows how bad it is? And so for that, we come to Jeremiah chapter 17 this morning. And I'm going to ask you to hear the word of the Lord given through the prophet Jeremiah who issued two things. The first was a warning to God's people leaders and followers and then a word of hope so jeremiah gave a word of warning and then he gave a word of hope he sounds like a whole bible to me well let's dig in this morning first of all jeremiah's warning is found in verses five and six this is what the lord says cursed are those who put their trust in mere humans who rely on human strength and turn their hearts away from the lord they are like stunted shrubs in the desert with no hope for the future. They will live in the barren wilderness in an uninhabited, salty land. It gives me the picture when I look at that of the salt flats out in the deserts. Good for nothing but riding race cars over, right? Uh, really uninhabitable. And uh, Jeremiah here presents a contrast between those people who cave into the culture and those people who, on the other hand, live godly lives no matter which way the wind is blowing. The cursed or the cursed are eventually going to be stunted shrubs, he says, in the barren desert, and they're not going to have any hope. But the godly ones who resist the cultural shift towards evil, they will draw from deep waters, he says. Their fruit will stand the test of time. In short, they have God's blessing, which is the hope of all who trust in Christ, not those who trust in the culture. In short, Jeremiah is saying, choose God or choose the culture. Choose God or choose Satan. Those are the only two choices. There is no in-between ground. The godly ones will resist the cultural shift towards evil. They'll draw from deep waters. Their fruit will stand the test of time. In short, they have God's blessing, which is the hope of everybody who trusts in Christ, not in the culture. What do we mean by the culture? It means the prevailing way things are in the country. The, the thing that's popular, the culture du jour, the, the thinking of the day, if you will. I don't have to tell you, as a Methodist group, that in the early Methodist movement under John and Charles Wesley, 
It bore the godly fruit of holiness which this nation enjoyed and the world was benefited by for generations. Among the fruit that came of the early 18th century ministry of the Methodists was that the world saw an end to slavery. The world saw the beginning of a sweeping spiritual revival and social reform that changed the entire world. In the mid part of the last century, the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, Methodists were also at the forefront of combating racism, putting an end to racism. Now, granted, there are pockets where uh, people still resist that, where racism still lives. And, you know, it's not up to me to, to talk about racism for this whole sermon, but the point is, Methodists stood firmly against such things. Why? It's because God stood firmly against such things. But the shift in recent generations of lukewarm waters into the baptismal fonts has made Methodism not a hot and passionate pro, uh, words escape me. Uh, Methodism has changed from a hot pursuit after God to more like a social club. More like a social club than a holy movement. Where once Methodists were considered people of the book of books, now we are a wide tent of anything goes. God's book lies collecting dust on coffee tables and hidden away in grandma's cabinet and sadly, even absent in many church worship services. I'm so glad that in this church, we read the gospel, we read the Old Testament, and the sermons, and this is not patting me on the back, but this is my aim every single week, is to bring you God's word and to expound on that word and to hold up the word that the people of the word might receive the word and grow by the word and live by the word and proclaim the word in this community. That's what we're about here. United Methodists have a huge book of rules, do we not? The discipline is about 600 pages thick. We have a huge book of rules, most of which mean nothing because nobody seems to want to offend anybody. Nobody wants to hold anybody accountable anymore. We elect people to lead, but the only place they lead, whoever's following, is into temptation. Where is the deliverance of leaders and followers who are hot pursuit of God? Where is God's remnant? Where are the Methodists who have God as their hope? Where are the people of God who have a backbone and not simply a wishbone, hoping that troubles will go away? I want to tell you this morning where they are. They're in Africa. <laughs> They're not in America. They're not us. We're not hot for God. While North American Methodism grows more tepid and lukewarm with every passing liberalization of faith and practice, our black brothers and sisters on the dark continent are standing in light. They're standing strong for biblical faith. They're standing strong for biblical marriage. They're standing strong for sexuality without perversion. And they're not slaves to money. They're not slaves to buildings because they know that they've got a king that owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And they know that they have a king who has a building, a palace not made with hands. Now, I've shared some of this with you before, but in 2007, I went to the South African nations of, nation of Zimbabwe to help build a seminary building and to teach African pastors something of the doctrine of end times in Daniel and Matthew and Revelation. And many of these young pastors were so hungry for the Word of God that they walked 10 or more miles every <coughs> single day to that seminary to hear God's Word, to learn God's Word. And after a full day of study and work building the building, they walked back home 10 or 20 miles, whatever it was, to attend their little farm plots so that they could meet with their congregations and see their families and meet under a tree somewhere. 
Folks in that part of the world have very little of the world's stuff, but they are covered in the anointing of God's Holy Spirit. While these days, the Holy Spirit is wondering if he's ever going to be invited back into a Methodist church. When I taught those people, those pastors, those hungry, God-hungry people, I taught them what I had learned in Scripture. But you know what? While I was teaching them, they were teaching me what it really means to be a disciple. Somebody who has tapped into the power of following Jesus Christ to make more disciples and transform this old world. While we were in Harare, <clears throat> Harare, Zimbabwe, the team that I went with held a four-day outdoor vacation Bible school. Outdoor. When we say outdoor, we think, oh, lovely, you know, beautiful, blue skies and everything. The skies are blue. The temperature is 114. <clears throat> At the last day of that vacation Bible school, I had the privilege of sharing the gospel message and giving an invitation through an interpreter. And that day... In that hour, in that moment, more than 100 little girls and boys received Jesus Christ as Savior. I'm not an evangelist. I admit that. That's not my gift. My gift is as pastor and teacher. I'm not an evangelist, but when the Spirit of God is working, you do the best you can and you get back out of the way. Because wonderful things do happen when God's Spirit is allowed to come down. I was no missionary to them. They were teaching me what the real work was all about. The children that I met that week were not looking for cell phones, but they taught me an awful lot. They were not looking for more sophisticated toys to collect dust. Their parents had taught them well to respect others and to turn to the Word of God for their answers. And these children, I mean, it was evident that that's what was happening, that they were turning to the Word of God, they were turning to Jesus. That was evident because when the invitation to accept Christ was offered, the children had another offer on the table. They were told they could do one of two things on this last day as the invitation was given. They could stay behind, learn a little bit more, and accept Christ. Or they could go with their teachers outside and have candy and play. What do you think the decision was? More than a hundred of them, which was probably 90%. We had a hundred and some odd, 112, 15, whatever it was. Over a hundred of them stayed behind to hear more about Jesus and to accept him as Savior and Lord. You know what? These children rarely had treats and free time to play. They were always either working on the farm or in school. So candy was always a big draw, but for these eight and nine and ten-year-old children, following Christ meant putting aside a momentary treat in favor of eternal salvation. Would that it would be true of us here in the United States. That we would live the kind of lives that would inspire our children to think like that. There are those who think that Africa and parts of South America are backward, the third world, poor, poor them, because of financial poverty and backward educational levels, these poor deluded monkeys. But in those impoverished places, the Spirit of God is moving, moving. And they are rich in the things of God, something of which the riches, all the riches of Solomon or Fort Knox will never buy or never even understand. The only backwardness of these people is that they've gone back to God's Word, while the rest of the so-called civilized and progressive world has gone forward to the shame of apostasy and godlessness and doggone proud of it. Beloved, if you think Africa is full of savages, I want to invite you to look at the savage nature of the so-called first world countries that we live in. We kill each other over stock portfolios. We kill each other over, over, over drugs. We kill each other and parade proudly our sexual perversity as if it's a badge of sophistication. We snuff out the lives of the unborn like squashing a mosquito. 
Meanwhile, the so-called savages of the African bush are sharing their <coughs> burdens with each other. They are enduring hardship and even persecuting persecution for being Christian. They protect life and gender purity. They preach the gospel of Jesus Christ pure, unadulterated, and doctrinally sound, and with the anointing of God's spirit. I want to ask you something. Who's the real savage? Who's the real savage? We Americans like to call ourselves a Christian nation, and friends, if we were ever such a thing as a Christian nation, we have graduated to become the evil, apostate, and nation, lost nation that we read about in Scripture. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 says it plainly. What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil. And the irony of it all is that we don't even know it. We live our lives as Pollyanna. Oh, isn't everything wonderful? We reject the gospel when we hear it. We squabble over nitpicking, nitpicking things like, will black people be black in heaven? And we're still murdering the prophets. We're murdering the unborn. And we're persecuting the true bride of Jesus Christ. And some of us will never find out those things because heaven will never be seen except from the side where the goats gather. There's coming a day when God is going to set things straight. God is going to continually search the hearts of human beings. And Jeremiah's warning here includes an assurance that where he finds unbelief, there will be judgment. Listen to 17 verses 9 and 10. The human heart is the most deceitful of all things. And desperately wicked. Who really knows how bad it is? Jeremiah was asking a rhetorical question there, but the answer comes back strong. Only God knows how desperately wicked our hearts are. But I, the Lord, Jeremiah writes, search all hearts and examine secret motives. I give all people their due rewards according to what their actions deserve. Now, the warning could not be clearer here. If a person will not serve Jesus, the cornerstone, then to you he becomes the rock of offense, a stumbling stone that will crush whatever life you may think you possess. Warnings, listen, warnings without consequences may be what parents do these days in parenting their children. But our eternal earthly, our eternal heavenly father knows no such thing. Because what God promises, God delivers. And if he has promised judgment for disobedience, it will take place. That's the warning of Jeremiah. Oh, that America might heed it. Oh, that you and I might heed it. But Jeremiah also has a word of hope in this. And it's found in verses 7 and 8. <coughs> Here, again, the word of the Lord. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord and have made the Lord their hope and confidence. They are like trees planted along a riverbank. Now, isn't that a good picture? Trees planted along a riverbank. Why? Because there's plenty of water for them all the time. Sure, they have to put down those roots and they have to reach out and grab that water, but it's there. <coughs> Such trees are not bothered by the heat. Why? Because they got plenty of hydration. They're not worried by long months of drought because the river is still there. Their leaves stay green and they never stop producing fruit. Those who trust, trust the Lord. Blessed are those who trust the Lord, Jeremiah wrote. This hope is a real simple thing. Those who place their trust in the Lord receive the Lord as their hope. They receive the Lord as their father, the protector, the provider. The one who has prepared a place for them in heaven, along with the other many mansions and rooms. Jesus' love and Jesus' friendship to us is the kind of eternal life and strength of deep roots in the heavens. You know what? There may be plenty of storms down here, but we stand like the great cedars of Lebanon. That's what... Jeremiah was alluding to here, the great cedars of Lebanon. You look at those trees and standing in groves, they, they grow incredibly immense and strong. 
because they support each other. It doesn't make a difference how many storms there are. They stand strong because they stand together. We may stand here these days physically battered. I want you to know those who are truly belonging to Christ are growing stronger with every wind of adversity. God sees to that. How strong is that strength? Paul wrote about it in the New Testament in the book of Romans chapter 8. Listen to what Paul wrote about those who are facing adversity here but are secure in heaven. Romans 8, 38. And I am convinced, Paul wrote, that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, neither angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. By the way, that promise is sure and includes whatever happened back then, but it's going to include whatever happens today. And it's going to include whatever happens tomorrow. And it's going to include whatever happens for a thousand years should Jesus carry it. That's because the edicts of human kings and queens, those of rulers on this earth, tend to fall apart like grass withering and fading to oblivion. But the word of our God stands forever. Forever. So I have an invitation for you that comes straight from Jeremiah this morning. I would that each one of us would heed the warning and latch on to the hope. The warning is, you put God on the back burner, there's judgment coming. The hope is, you put God on your first burner and only burner. And it's the blessedness of a tree planted by the rivers of living water. So heed the warning. Latch on to the hope. And in a very practical sense, let me say it this way now. There's an old saying about following your heart. Oh, that's a good, good way to do the right thing. What did Jeremiah say about that? Your heart can deceive you. There's one exception to that. If your heart is so totally given over to Jesus Christ, then it will guide you straight. Because your wishes will go along with his wishes. And anytime you do that, you're right smack in the middle of the hope of Jeremiah, not the warning. Pray with you. Father God, our prayer is that you would teach each of us with whatever it takes to heed the warning and latch on to the hope. Lord, allow us to let everything else fade into oblivion except obedience to you reception of your love and your grace and your truth as our watchword. Lord, our hearts, just like Eve, our hearts fail us with uh, that which tries to deceive us in life. And we don't know the right way to go. And if it feels good, we really ought not to do it. But Lord, we are easily deceived. And our heart can even deceive our own minds. So, Father, we pray for the Holy Spirit to enter our hearts and minds through our faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, that we might be directed and guided toward your kingdom, that we might latch on to the hope and escape the danger of the warning. In this we pray in Jesus Christ's sake. Let it be so. Amen. Our hymn is uh, Just As I Am, a very familiar song to you. It's verses 1, 2, and then the last verse, 1, 2, and 6. This is a great prayer to pray at the end of a service like this. Well, we've talked about the grace of God. We've talked about the mansions that are over the hilltop, if you will, and uh, that we're looking forward to, that Jesus is preparing for us. How do we go there? We go there just as we are because there's nothing we can do to earn it. Just as I am, without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. That's what we're singing. That's our prayer. Let's stand together and let that be so in our lives. Lord, this is our prayer. I come. I come. You're on my front door.
your prayer, just as I am. I am in answer to your prayer. He is able to cleanse that heart, make it pure every bit. And you can take that heart out into the community, and guess what? You know what? On the heels of that prayer, on the heels of God cleansing your heart, you know what happens? When you go into the community like that, in that condition, people know. They know just by being around you. And I think that's what God is hunting in us. As a Methodist church, as individuals, that's what he's hunting for. People who will accept him fully. Let his Holy Spirit cleanse us, clean us up, and send us out into the community where people will know the difference. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, God bless you as you go. <coughs> go in purity. Go